Good evening. It's, it's great to see so many colleagues and friends uh, in the audience tonight. My name is Troy Osborne. I'm Dean at Conrad Grable University College. I'm uh, very pleased to welcome you to the 2023 Benjamin E.B. Lecture. This is a series of lectures that offers Grable faculty an opportunity to share their ideas with the wider community. I should say it's an opportunity for us to learn from Grable faculty. And it makes accessible the fruit of their research and hopefully inspires one another towards a larger vision of the life, the mind, and the spirit. I'd like to give the territorial acknowledgement. Conrad Grable and University of Waterloo are built on the traditional territory of the Atawandaran, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. This land was given in treaty in 1784 to the Six Nations. That includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. As we at Grable work on building relationships with our indigenous friends and neighbors, we are educating ourselves and working to change our understanding of the narrative and of our place. This lecture series is named after Benjamin Eby, an early bishop and educator in that early community of Upper Canada in the 1800s that settled on the uh, Haldeman Tract. It was Eby and a few people of similar stature who set up the course of life in Waterloo County in the first half of the 19th century. E.B. promoted education among the group descended from the Mennonites who purchased that land. So it is with E.B.'s work at supporting education, literacy, singing, and theology in mind that this series is named. At this time, I'd like to thank and express my uh, acknowledge and express my gratitude for the financial support of Jim and Golden Pancrats towards supporting the series. And Jim is there in the audience tonight. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, Jim uh, was. The Dean of Conrad Grable from 2006 to 2014 and served as interim president from 2016 to 17. Those of us who worked with Jim are still grateful for his support for faculty teaching and research, and in many ways he strengthened Grable's academic priorities. And Jim had the ability to uh, be interested in every single thing we were doing. And it was always great to talk about our work with Jim. Uh, we are thankful for the warm hospitality that Jim and Goldine welcomed us with no point of here at Grable. Uh, thank you to Berger Wyshynski, my, uh, my assistant for helping to organize this, the communications department for recording it and uh, for putting this, this be online uh, when it's over on our YouTube channel. And uh, thanks in advance to our kitchen for preparing the reception this evening. Following tonight's lecture and some question and answer, I invite you to join me downstairs. Sorry. <laughs> uh, we'll have a reception downstairs where we continue the conversation after the question and answer. So please uh, leave some time to kind of join us for some light refreshments. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's lecturer, Associate Professor of Music, Maisie Soon. Maisie is an ethnomusicologist, an educator, and performer with interests in a variety of fields, including ethnomusicology, anthropology, music theory, and analysis, performance and ritual studies, and peace and conflict studies, psychology and health studies. She's a performer as well and a general director of the college's two gamelan ensembles, where she shares her passion for Balinese music. For nearly or over 10 years, Maisie and the gamelan ensembles have introduced this rich musical tradition with communities beyond Grable and the University of Waterloo and into the surrounding community. We are very grateful for that, for that, uh, that work. Maisie's current research focuses primarily on the geographical areas of Morocco and Indonesia, and she has published widely in scholarly journals and presented at conferences. In 2014, she received the Jaap Kunst Prize in recognition for an article published in African Music Journal on the, of the International Library of African Music. And it's some of this work uh, and uh, work from her dissertation at the University of British Columbia that she'll be sharing with us tonight. Um, um, recent work of hers explores rhythm and repetition in community healing rituals from a psychological and cross-cultural perspectives. And I'm especially excited to talk to uh, you about her current book project, tentatively titled Sounding Resilience, The Art and Soul of Black Moroccan Music. In it, Maisie delves into the world of improvisational music in Morocco, specifically focusing on public Nawa performances by drawing from various academic perspectives on the black African diaspora music, ritual studies, cognitive aspects of music, oral music traditions and field work with ritual and music leaders, she explores how musicians adapt to changing times while holding on to their cultural heritage. 
thus shedding new light on the resilience, creativity, and determination of these practitioners as they navigate their way through a shifting Moroccan society and beyond. Maisie's research has been generously supported by grants. She's an active member of several music societies, including the Society for Ethnomusicology, the Canadian Society for Traditional Music, and the British Forum for Ethnomusicology. And she has had extensive involvement in, that includes editorial roles for music journals and leadership positions in, in organizing conferences. She's also a cherished colleague in the music department in at Grable, and we are thrilled to have her share her insights with us this evening. Welcome, Maisie. We look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you, Troy. I was excited to see you start my lecture for me, so. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming this evening. So I would like to take a moment first to acknowledge and express my deep gratitude to my teachers in Morocco, Malam Mahmoud Ganya, Mokhal Mazeda, Malam Abdullah Ganya, and Malam Mokhtar for their friendship, support, collaboration, and most importantly, their trust in me to share what they what I have learned from their experience, music, and culture, and to share their stories. The content of my talk, as uh, Troy mentioned, is taken from the second and third chapters of my book manuscript with the working title, Sounding Resilience, The Art and Soul of Black Moroccan Music. The book investigates the significance of spiritual music belonging to a black African diaspora society called Ganawa during a period of rapid change wrought by late 20th and early 21st century forces of third wave globalization in Morocco. It draws on fieldwork in Essebera and Fez between 2006 and 2009, new research in 2018 and 2019, and a 20-year friendship and collaboration with hereditary Ganawa practitioners that began in 20, uh, 2001. The sh sugary mint tea bubbles into my glass as Si Mohammed pours it from the large silver pot from a distance that gives it the aeration needed to achieve an optimal flavor. He sets it down on a silver tray next to a plate of peppery shortbread cookies, a perfect pairing to the tea's sweetness. He returns to the kitchen. Makadma Zeta and I resume our conversation. On many occasions, I have sat in their dimly lit living room, glued to the sadari, Moroccan sofa, enthralled by her stories, unaware of the daylight hours passing, save for different members of her family coming and going throughout the day sometimes joining in a conversation, sometimes not. Today, we sit alone. My mother told me the story about her father, she continues. There was a young boy who lived in the Medina, or, or old city, near my father. One day, he suddenly stopped talking, stopped doing anything. He was a boy, like all others, playing in the streets with the neighborhood children, running around, talking. Nobody knew what happened to him. He was like that for a long time, not playing, not talking, just staying at home. His parents took him to see doctors. His family had money, but nothing helped. Nobody knew what happened. One day he was fine, then the next day he became severely ill. Afterwards, a woman came to the house and told my grandfather about it a while later. He listened, then said, tell the father to bring the boy to me. The next day the mother brought her son to the grotto, Sidi Burisha. This was before the Zawiya Bilal, Sidna Bilal, the Ganawa sanctuary was built, Zayda, Mukamma Zayda told me. It's a place by the sea, among the rocks, not far from the Zawiya. My mother said, the boy came, he heard the music. My grandfather played the gemri. She said, the boy followed the music to the grotto. He listened, oh, he loved the music. And then he started to dance. He danced and danced, all night he danced. His mother was so happy to see her son dancing like that. She was in tears. The next day, the boy was like he always was. He was talking again, playing in the streets like before. He was healed. My grandfather could do a lot, a lot of special things, lots of baraka, miraculous gift energies, very strong, and with the gemri. The gemri had two strings then, not like now. Musical instruments are much more than the perceived affordance as sound-producing devices. Beyond aesthetic satis satisfaction, they may be imbued with meaning and carry a special value to the individuals and societies who use and make them. To be sure, the significance may range from the everyday to the spiritual. Ethnomusicologist Bonnie Wade writes, quote, when people design and craft instruments, they both express cultural values and create musical practices through them. Indeed, instruments are 
items of expressive culture as well as material culture, works of art, symbols, technological inventions, tools for earning a livelihood. Some instruments carry extra musical associations so clear and strong that the mere sound or sight of them will transmit meaning to anyone in a knowledgeable group. End quote. For example, for Brazilians, the distinctive timbre of the one-stringed barabao conjures up the spirit of rebellion, resistance, and liberation of enslaved Africans. Canadian ethnomusicologist of Native American music, Beverly Diamond, notes that the vertical bass drum was turned to the horizontal powwow, powwow drum, signifying that its energy and associated meaning transformed from war to peace. For some, an instrument may be a treasured artifact, appreciated for its, for its aesthetic value, it may also symbolize the status of the high culture of prestige accorded grand pianos in American living rooms. Wade writes that in Japan, the elevated status of piano owners harkens back to the nation's period of modernization in the 19th and early 20th centuries, when European music was adopted in the process. The status accorded an instrument may be transferred to its players or makers, creating a socio-musical hierarchy within and beyond ensembles. The above examples serve as an introduction to the ways meaning may be encoded onto instruments in diverse cultures around the world, and to illustrate its social effective nature. In other words, an instrument and its music's capacity to affect practitioners, performers, and listeners. Music's effective potential is embedded in the multiple temporalities it realizes, connecting to and constructing past and future possibilities at larger and smaller scales. The opening vignette connects the Gemri to a history of healing, a lineage of healing practitioners, but also conveys belief in the Gembri as a potent force, affirmed by the stories of their ancestors, passed on to future generations. In the following, I explore the temporalities associated with the sight and sound of the Gembri, which give rise to a web of meanings contributing to its effective potential. So my research uses scholarly discourses on music of Africa and the Black African diaspora, ritual studies, and cognitive studies in music and improvisation, music analysis, and ethnographic fieldwork findings with ritual and music leaders who have a foothold in spiritual practice and global market and the global marketplace. So I mentioned Malam Mahmoud, Mokam Lazeda, Malam Abdullah, and Malam Mokhtar already. And so just note that the title Malam is conferred to master musicians of the Ganawa Lila ritual. Mokalama is a title that, that is given to an officiant of that ritual. Given the nature of the music, primary to this research has been my relationship with the Ganya family who is one of the two Ganawa families with sub-Saharan ancestry in Esawira. Children of the reputable Malam Mokadma pair, Malam Bukar Ganya and Mokadma Aisha Cabral, the Ganya leaders are third generation hereditary Ganawa practitioners and guardians of their cultural tradition. After seeking and being granted permission to study Ganawa music with them, they welcomed me into each of their families, opening many doors that would not have been privy to me as a cultural outsider. For this, I have been deeply grateful. My collaborators and teachers, they explained that the key to learning Ganawa music was going to the spiritual community gatherings called Lilas. In contrast to the highly publicized festivals, concerts, tourist shows of Ganawa music, Lilas are private occasions. So, so entrance and even knowledge of these events are restricted to an inner circle. The Ghana leaders and their family members took me to Lilas around Morocco and supported my presence when it was questioned. I participated as much as I was able, recording when appropriate, but mostly I watched and listened, experiencing the gradual transfer of knowledge alongside their apprentices and children. Malam Mokta emphasized, quote, There's no school for the Gembri, it's the Lila. These days people listen to cassettes, they don't go to Lila. The Lila is school. The Gembri is an oblong plucked lute made of three elements, wood, skin, and metal. Used respectively, for, sorry, used respectively for the resonator body and neck, sound table, and sacera, a feather-like metal sheet with strings attached to the end of the neck that jingles sympathetically when the instrument is played. The three strings are made of braided goat intestines. The open strings are tuned to relative pitches that vary according to the vocal range of the malam. So if you represent in cipher notation, um, the low string would be one, the middle string would be four, and the high string would be eight, so an octave apart. It's not quite in two, but... It's tough to tune these instruments, because they're gut strings. The inventory of pitches may be heard when a malam checks the tuning by playing the msawi, the collection of pitches, in a prescribed fashion resembling a tuning formula before he plays. 
Here's an example of Malam Amokta uh, Mahmud playing that. <laughs> for enjoying playing the Isawi, and sometimes that would last for 10 minutes if he wasn't at a Mila performance. The Gimbali, supported by Karaka, a large metal castanet seat in the bottom left corner, animates the Lila, the performance of which practitioners regard first and foremost as a spiritual invocation. of Sub-Saharan Africa, Islam, and indigenous Amazigh, the sounds of the Gembri are crucial to honoring, propitiating, and invoking a pantheon of supernatural entities called Muluk that comprises both African spirits and Islamic saints under the dominion of Allah. Up until about 50 years ago, Lilas were held in private consecrated spaces due to its secrecy and its, to its marginal status. Jazz pianist Randy Weston, traveling in Morocco in the 1960s, explains that he was, quote, initially not permitted to attend a lila if you were not part of that society. Moroccan sociologist Fatima Manissi, writing about the 1940s, about the, in the 1940s, reports that their rituals were considered un-Islamic by nationalists and dismissed. In 20, 2007, Moroccan anthropologist Zineb Majdouli averts that, quote, in spite of their allegiance to Allah and Muhammad, the Ghanaian community always lived at the margins of a dominant socio-religious system. Until the late 20th century, these closed music ritual gatherings minimized interaction from the outside world and local Moroccans alike, and created an ideal space, or to borrow from musicologist Christopher Small's treatise on the music of black African Americans, an ideal society, which led, led to the emergence of Ganawa as a collective identity and the Lila ritual as a systematic practice. Here's an example of the music from a Lila I attended in 2006. Thank you. 
Late 20th century forces of globalization, in particular burgeoning world music industry, surge in annual music festivals and growing tourism industry, ushered in a new era for local music traditions. And Ganawa music gained worldwide popularity and opened the door to new public performances in Morocco and beyond, transforming its significance, identity, and practice in profound ways. Reputable black and our families, like the third generation Ganyan Matmalans of Esawira, were major contributors to this phenomenon. As spiritual leaders, the Ganyans upheld their duty to honor the Maluk and needs of the Ganyan community, play music for Lila, safeguarding ritual knowledge and practice, and abiding by a strict code of conduct inherited from their parents, whilst adapting to and balancing the needs and demands of an evolving global community and new social economic and, po and, new social -economic and political pressures. Beyond Morocco, the growing number of Ganawa music performances on festival stages abroad, audio and video recordings, presentations, publications, media, and discussions all helped to expand its international status at the turn of the century. Away from the highly publicized displays, private ritual occasions for the music continued to serve the collective needs of followers. The broad appeal of Ganawa music, both to outsiders to the tradition within Morocco and without, began before tourism and the world music scene took hold. The coastal nation of Morocco, where the Atlantic and Mediterranean waters meet, has appealed to international visitors for centuries, explorers, scholars, government officials, musicians, and artists alike. A gateway to Western Europe and continental Africa via the Atlantic and Mediterranean coastline and sub-Saharan desert, a, uniquely diverse, a unique diversity of cultures populates the mild and fertile Northwest region, guarding a reputation for, their, for its richness, hospitality, and tolerance. Like its visitors, interest in Ganawa music varied widely from being exploratory, scholarly, musical, to artistic, and came primarily from the outside before the late 20th century. In the late 18th century, Danish government official and writer George Hjertzing Holst visited Marrakesh and Fez. The report from his travels between 1760 to 1768 includes the earliest detailed sketch of a Moroccan lute, which resembles today's oblong-shaped gembri, illustrating three strings, tuning rings, a string of beads, and a sacera, though it appears to be bent forward rather than backward or to the side. Host drawing and description has been referenced three times over the last century by musicologist and Arabist Henry Farmer in a 1928 article on a North African folk instrument, ethnomusicologist Eric Cherry in his historical overview of plucked lutes in West Africa in 1996, and most recently in, 19, in 2020 by art historian Cynthia Becker, his brief caption labels the instrument as a Ganawa guitar, reveals information about its, how it's played, that is, with the fingers plucked or strummed rather than bowed, and describes the sound of sacera as, quote, giving off a strong noise, end quote. The sound of the instrument itself, however, is missing. He also identifies the musicians as black Moroccans, specifically those brought from Guinea, so in those days the term Guinea also re represented West Africa more broadly. Based on the shape illustrated in the drawing, Cherry notes that the gambling may be related to a lute performed by a griot, a term that refers to master musician, praise singer, and storytellers in West Africa, who are also considered cultural, cultural guardians of an oral tradition. He writes that the Ganawa Gembri resembles 
the large, Bamba, the large Bambara Bungani rather than the modern day rectangular box as shown in this photo. Furthermore, he notes that the sesera is also like an accessory found on the griot lutes, which Cherry characterizes as being consistent with the widespread African practice rooted in an aesthetic that values a buzzing or jiggling sound. Other eth ethnomusicologists have similarly drawn a West African link based on the morphology of the gimbri. Andre Schaffner writes, quote, one finds guitar drums comparable in their structure and function in sub-Saharan Africa or West Africa. The boat-shaped case of the hajuj, or gembri, recalls the divinatory lute harp of Dagon priests in Mali. However, the genau of Morocco confers a symbolic meaning to the hajuj that belongs to them." End quote. A diversity of shapes, materials, and tuning mecha mechanisms, however, are used across Africa. Farmer notes that not all Western, West African lutes have an oblong, trough-like body. Many have hemispherical, calabash bodies, and a few even come in pear-shaped bodies. Similarly, Philip, uh, ethnomusicologist Philip Schuyler recognizes the diversity and warns of oversimplification when discussing the Gembri's origins. He writes, the Negro-Arab dichotomy will not stand. There is a need for a more precise definition of subtypes. All descendants of the Egyptian lute should be considered as members of one large category. There are at least three types of Egyptian lute, the Ganawa Gembri, the Arab Gembri, and the Ruwais Lotar. Of all Moroccan instruments, the Ganawa Gemri comes closest to the lutes of West Africa. In common with the lutes of West African and ancient Egypt, it is tuned with sliding leather loops of rings in what seems a purely African touch, a feather of steel rimmed with jingling rings, a sesera, is planted in the end of the neck." End quote. Note that Madame Abdullah's Gemri on display here bears a strong resemblance to the, to the Ngoni which is distinct from the rectangular-shaped uh, gembri his brother Malam Mahmoud plays in this photo. Malam Mahmoud's lute resembles the box shape of 19th to late 19th century lutes housed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, though those go by different names. Alternate names, uh, in Morocco, alternate names exist for the Ganawa gembri, which includes Sintar, uh, Sintir, as indicated on the left, and Hajjuj. Their usage appears to be related to regional variations. The term khalam, or khalam, transliterated with an X instead of H, also refers to a plucked griot lute in Senegal that resembles today's Ganawa Gibri. The term rebab is also used for gold lutes, shown here. It should be noted that in Morocco, Gibri is a generic term used for all skin-covered lutes across the nation. Two from late 19th century are found at the, metro at the Met. Um, note there also are alternative or alternate spellings for the word gimbri. So unfortunately, the information that you find at these museums um, are not very detailed beyond Morocco or probably Sundanese or Morocco or Algeria. So, so in those days, there, there wasn't very much information um, about the instruments that were seen by explorers and travelers and, and so forth. So that's why um, Host's drawing really stands apart from the rest of the 18th century. Accounts of the Gembri allude to links with Sub-Saharan Africa, however, its origins remain uncertain. Travelers and scholars have considered this question with regard to its morphology as discussed above, and also its etymology. There appears to be a general consensus that the Gembri we are familiar with today arrived in Morocco from West Africa. However, whether it is indigenous to Egypt or to West Africa is unclear. Three ethnomusicologists, uh, Philip Schuyler, Roger Blench, and Eric Cherry, agree on three possible trajectories and two origins. It originated in ancient Egypt and came directly uh, from east to west. Number two, it originated in ancient Egypt, traveled down to the south of the Sahara, across to the west, and then up, and then later up north to Morocco, and then much later, or a little later, to Algeria and Tunisia. Or three, it originated in West Africa, traveled eastward across the Sahara and north to ancient Egypt, then later back to West Africa and eventually back up to Morocco. So etymological considerations of the term Gembri similarly suggest links to the Arab world and West Africa. I address a few here. In his article, um, quoting the farmer's later article in 1939 now, suggests the term Gembri, quote, may well may very well be the native pronunciation of the Arabic tumbura lute. 
Chari notes, however, that the substitution of G for T is not found in West African languages, but the common sounds N, B, R, Nibur, are difficult to ignore. In other words, the Gembri might have been derived from the Arabic kanabir, lut, or the related tumbur. Chari extends the discussion making a connection to sub-Saharan etymology, specifically the term gambare, a lute played by the Soninke griots. He writes, quote, it seems reasonably clear that there is a linguistic relationship between the terms gimri, which denotes the North African Ganao lut, and gambare, the lut of Soninke griots that may date back to the time of ancient Ghana, between the, 19th, the 9th and 13th century. The possibility that the North African Ganao term gimri comes from the West African Soninke term gambare is quite plausible, particularly given the ancient associations that the gambare has and the probable Soninke origin of at least some of the North African Ganao. The possibility that the Sonenki term gambare is related to the Arabic term tumbur also seems plausible, but this does not necessarily mean that the Sonenki got their instrument from the Arabs, simply that the instrument may have acquired the Arabic term." End quote. Similarly, African literature scholar Thomas Hale links the words Ganawa and Grio and their populations. He writes, the word aginao, so deeply embedded in the, in the intertwined cultures of the Northwest African region, was, almost likely a, was most likely a step in the process of linguistic change that began with Ghana and went on to Ganawa, Aginao, Guinea, and Giro to produce Grio. Hale's reading appears to support a correlation between the Ganawa Gembri and the instruments used by Grio, suggesting links to the larger Mande group in West Africa, which include the Bambara and Solenke. Writings and Ganawa repertoire appear to corroborate a historic connection with the Bambara. American expatriate and writer Paul Bowles, who lived in Morocco for over 50 years, mentions the Bambara language spoken by the Ganawa he encountered in the 1930s. French commissioner René Brunel writes about hearing songs sung in the Bambara language during rituals he listened, uh, he witnessed in the 1920s, which based on the descriptions may have been similar to the Ganawa Lila today. In addition, the Ganawa Lila includes a repertoire referred to as Bulet Bambara, Children's of Bambara. On a related note, Ganawa music articulates an affiliation with Bilal, the Prophet Muhammad's first muezzin, caller to prayer, an Abyssinian emancipated by the Prophet. In performances, veneration of Bilal, whom they consider the patron, their patron saint, echoes the 13th century Mandinka founders of the Mali Empire who claimed descent from Bilal in order, uh, in order to, according to El Hamel, legitimize their power in Islamic terms. Extending the etymological debate, which leaves room for much speculation, to associations with Sahelian African cultural groups offers further supports for the Gemini's West African origin. With regard to the sound and context of Ganawa music, little is found as well in these early accounts. Henry Farmer's 1928 account is among the earliest source and is worth quoting in full. In his article uh, about the North African folk instrument, he writes, no Negro fet would be considered complete without the gumbri, whether it be the popular merrymaking or the hadra seance of the fakir to Bukhara, the gumbri will be found, striving to make as few notes heard above the din of the large metal castanets of Karakhub and the noisy drum, tabal adabdaba, which maintain the rhythm, which maintain the rhythm. When there's no drum, which is frequently the case away from the fet, the gumbri plays as his own rhythmic accompaniment by beating the skin of the gimri with his hand. The farmer's description offers pertinent information about the gimri's significance, who and what the music is for, its musical texture, ensemble, and playing technique. However, it requires some explication. At the time of his writing, the term it uses to identify people of black African descent is appropriate. However, it had become obsolete by the second half of the 20th century, I was replaced by different names throughout the decades, and most recently by the term black. Farmer accurately states the cruciality of the Gemri for black festivals, though his specification for the Hadra of the Fakir, which refers to the mystic ceremonies of Sufi ascetics, seems to be inaccurate. I speculate that he is instead referring to the Lila of the Makadamas or Ganao Manu. He also describes the contrasting dynamics between the Gemri and the Karakab, which play simultaneously, creating the creating the predominant texture associated with Ganawa music today. However, the drum typically is not part of the texture uh, of the Gemri and the Karakab, due to it being also a lead instrument and a different part of Lila. 
His description also alludes to a musician playing the gemri on his own, which is part of a malam's duty, as I will discuss in the next section. I sit in the dimly lit living room with Makadam and Zeta. We are surrounded by the rest of her family. Her daughters, not yet teenagers, are close by listening to her conversation. Si Mohammed Utanin, her husband, and eldest daughter, Saida Batash, who is the same age as me, prepare sweet mint tea and savory snacks. By now, we've known each other for nearly a decade. Si Mohammed and Saida are my close friends. With Saida, I also address Makadam and Zeta as Mama when appropriate. It is the period of the Ganawa and World Music Festival, the fourth one I have attended since 2001. And once again, we reenact similar conversations, casually talking about the slate of performers over the four-day festival, which Ganya Master is to perform, who got a contract, who is kept waiting, and so on. That day, the conversations took a new turn. It was the second day of the festival, and I shared an observation of a woman dancing as they might during a lila on stage that night, the night before. Performance studies and Moroccan Kanawa scholar Deborah Katja mentions this occurring in performances abroad, but alludes that the Malam would never do it at home in Morocco. Up until that time, I had not witnessed a theatricalized possession dance on stage during the local festival. Her eyebrows raised. Saida responded in her usual calm demeanor with a hint of surprise. Ah. Makadma Zeta glanced away in what seemed like disapproval. See Mohammed in earshot responds. They do whatever. That should not be done. Who is playing? The above excerpt of my conversation with Makan Mazeda and her family offers a small glimpse of the changes in Ganawa cultural practice since the increasing popularity of the festival and suggests, at least for the Ganya family, that there is a code of conduct, unwritten rules, what Makanma calls the law. The distinctive nature of the Gembri is reflected in its repertoire, which is played for the Maluk. Ganawa live according to philosophy of life governed by the coexistence and interaction of temporal and supernatural realms. This is not unique and shares resemblances to other cultural beliefs and practices. The worldview is based on a trinity, the existence of dualism, supernatural, temporal, heaven and earth, and a third intermediary element, a codified meta-language of music, dance, olfaction, and ritual objects that works to balance and unite opposite yet complementary worlds of the universe. Harmony must be maintained between the seen or human world and the unseen world of the, of the Muluk. Through regular offerings and blessings, the Ganawa balance these opposing yet complementary forces, heal the afflicted, and deepen their alliance with the Muluk. As the first opening vignette illustrated, this is mediated by the Gimbri. The Gimbri is at the heart of the order. It communicates with the supernatural, the muluk, and engenders and sustains um, trance dancing. At heightened moments of the dance, the singing and karakop stop, giving way to the voice of the gimbi. Motivic variations escalate to a new level and may be directly correlated with the social stimuli associated with the given context. According to Malam Ganya, the father of the Ganya, the third generation Ganya family, the gimbri is a crucial instrument in, in Ganawa rituals. It is through this device that the trance occurs. Scholars of similar cultures have also noted the centrality of instrumental melody and rhythm for attracting spirits. French anthropologist Rouget writes, music is the condition sine qua non of the trance experience. Similar to other cultures, music is trans cultures, music is indispensable to the success of Ganawa Lila. In the Santeria ritual, the singer directs songs to a partition on the verge of, of being possessed. The back to drums intensify responses playing loudly and quickly. These praise songs and bata rhythms are meant to bring the orisha to earth so that it may speak through the body of the devotee. In Sufi ceremonies such as Kawali, the, singer, the singer's aim is always to move, to arouse, to draw a listener toward his sheikh, the saint, to God, and into the, the ecstasy of mystical union. Crapanzano defines Ri's play during the Hamacha ceremony as the, quote, highly ornamented musical phrases which drive the participants into trance, end quote. During the Ganawa Lila, the Gimbri plays patterned sounds that correspond to musical codes for the Maluk. Viviana, French anthropologist Viviana Bach writes that, quote, following the melody of the Gimbri is the best way for the soul of the adept to be caught in a veritable lake of illusions that induces him to fall. In, this study, in his study of the relations between music and trance, Rouget looks at two aspects of music, the signifying side and the signified side. 
On the signified side, quote, when the music, when the music is specific to a particular deity, melodies played on an instrument have the same function as sung mottos. They are call signs. Indeed, these melodies often are mere instrumental versions of the sung mottos, which are deprived of their text. But when we hear them, men and gods also hear the words and relate to them. The musical motto, which varies across cultures, quote, for each needs the airs of the melody known to him and phrases that he understands, end quote, can thus be defined as a sign whose signified is the muluk in this case, to which it refers and whose signifier has three facets, linguistic, musical, and choreographic. So this short, this short clip supports Rouget's claim. Here, Mokhama Zeta is dancing as her brother, Mokhama Mokta, plays Gimbri. At, at this point in the piece, the Karakapa stop playing, and we witness an intimate interaction between the Malam and the Mokhama, or the Gimbri and the Salahi, the saint of Sidi Musa. <laughs> Practices like the rishas of the Cuban Yoruba, or the orixas of Bahian Candomblé, or the Vuvuza of Malawi Tumbuka, which act as a type of speech surrogacy and serve as the imagined voices of and for specific spirits, the musical motives played on the Gemri are symbolic of the Muluk in a dual sense, as musical identities and as, quote, the voice of the Muluk. First, the Gemri attracts the Maluk by sounding their musical identities, effectively calling their names. Second, these patterns function as museums, calling on the adepts. Third, the repeating patterns enable recognition, allowing listeners to entrain and get into a groove. And fourth, the variations articulated upon familiar patterns and engender a heightened emotional response that sustains a dance and possibly trans phenomena. Upon hearing the familiar motive of their milk or the Maluk, Adepts exhibit emotional responses, intense feelings, tears, herculation, which may engender a physical response leading to the, the desire to get up from their seated position, move towards the space before the gimli, and dance. Some text in the early portion of the invocation process, particularly during the refrain, renders the identity of the supernatural entity explicit to the ritual community, regardless of experience and knowledge, inviting all to participate. Furthermore, the minimal variations on the sound patterns also contribute to this purpose. While it is the combined texture of the Gembri voice and Karaka that facilitates the dynamics of trance, it is the Gembri that is the key to sustaining this phenomenon. Aside from the clarity of words sung during the refrain, usually in unison by the chorus and the malam, the words sung, the words sung by the malam tend to be obscure. Viviana Pak suggests that the intentionality to obscure and elude plays a part in effective response and the onset of possession. The instrumental section begins, the increasing tempo, dynamics, and motivic variations, and musical cues of the instrumental portion executed by the Gembri help to sustain possession and potentially the miraculous transformations of will willing adepts, which signify the arrival of the particular muluk being invoked. At that moment, the Gembri, like the adept, becomes possessed and, quote, speaks with the voice of the muluk, directing and supporting the movements of the dancer. I think there's a college in Ganawa scholar, Timothy Thuzin, eloquently avers, quote, the linchpin of Ganawa music is the expression of the Gimbri, which speaks with the voice of the Muluk. While the rhythmic accompaniment of clapping or karakub and the antiphonal strains of Ganawa singing are essential to the flow and feel of Tagnawit, Ganawaness, their importance is ultimately secondary to that of the Gimbri in terms of achieving the desired expression of Jagba, dance. Indeed, in climactic moments of trances, both singing and even rhythmic accompaniment are often abandoned to yield the entire musical texture to the gimbi and the trancing body in co-enunciative expression." Fusen's, 
analysis corroborates with Rouget's thinking that as a general rule, quote, in which traditions, um, in traditions in which the mu music for possession dance is both instrumental and vocal, the instrumental music always prevails and is always more continuous than the vocal. In this comparison between two performances of Leila Mimuna, we can see in the figure that Malam Abdullah's version on top is significantly shorter than Malam Mahmoud's uh, on the bottom. So here, this is just a, um, a, a figure of the different sections. So I represents the uh, instrumental prelude, the V is the folk vocal section, and then when the D starts, that's when the dance happens, and that's when the voices subside. And so you will have um, the Gibli and the Karakots playing during the section only. And T is just a, tra a transitional uh, phrasing. So if you look at the section D in particular, Malam Abdullah is significantly shorter than Malam Mahmoud's. So Malam Abdullah uh, played this version during a recording session without dancers. So during a lila, if there are no dancers, the duration of the piece is shorter and similar temporal durations and proportions may be observed. If one or more adepts participate in possession dance, the piece lasts longer. In addition to the vocal section being longer, V, the temporal proportion of D also increases. In Malum Mahmoud's recording made during a leader with dancers, uh, section V and D are respectively 2 minutes and 31 seconds and 2 minutes and 8 seconds, which are nearly equal in duration. In Malum Mahmoud's rendition, V and D are about 2 minutes and the other one is 23 seconds, respectively. In some cases, as, as um, I, I say in a different chapter of my book, um, section D may be a lot longer than V. So it really depends on the ritual situation. As for your... Oh, I portion that for you. Before, gambri motives are rarely exactly repeated and are subject to frequent temporal manipulations. During vocal invocation, variations tend to be minimal as the gambri serves as vocal accompaniment. As dancing progresses, the music intensifies, the vocal stop, and the tempo dynamics and the frequency and degree of musical variations increase. Malam improvised Malam improvise variations by creating and recreating patterns from basic building blocks of the gambri motive or motives, as shown in this example. response that manifests in the form of chills and shivers or perambulation or tears when listening to music. It is beyond the scope of this talk, but suffice it to say that intense, that these heightened responses may be engendered through temporal manipulation. Uh, music cognition scholar David Huron calls dynamics um, of expectation, which is linked to memory.
Knowledge and symbolic associations may differ among practitioners from different regions and even in the same family depending on their roles within the society and may be protected for cultural reasons. The value of the Gemri to culture bears, however, is articulated in their beliefs about its cruciality to rituals as discussed above. Comments about and behaviors toward the Gemri by practitioners and participants provide readily observable evidence. As mentioned at the start of the talk, until the popularity of Ganao music at the end of the 20th, of 20th century Morocco, the Gemri was primarily discussed in terms of its use in rituals. French language monographs in the mid to late 1990s referred to it as the principal instrument for spirit possession and possession trance rituals. Pack notes that the Gemri is a receptacle of the genies, of the spirits. She quotes her informant who explains, the Gemri is like someone who knocks on the door of the Muluk. Since the 21st century, articles and monographs continue to stress its significance in Lila for culture bearers particularly in light of the rapid changes wrought by global forces. In American Moroccan historian L. Hamel's 2008 article, Constructed Diasporic Identity, he captures the Gemri's value to hereditary practitioners in a quote by the late Malam Buka Gemma. He says, quote, the Gemri is a crucial instrument in Ganawa rituals. It is through this device that the trance occurs. For this reason, the Ganawa do not say they play music, but they say they call out to the spirits to manifest. If there's no Gemri, there will be no trance. The Gemri provides the rhythm for the trance." End quote. One of my teachers, Sima Hamad, emphasized, the Malam is like a pilot. Using the Gemri, he drives, guides, and directs us up into the air and through the clouds that we cannot see past. In summary, the Gemri per performs a triple duty during the Lila. It entrains listeners with the Gemri's rhythm, facilitates and sustains trans phenomena, and it in invokes and communicates with the Muluk through musical models, with the goal of maintaining or restoring harmony within individuals and the collective community. The behavior of audience members attests to the value of the Gemri in both festival and ritual performances of Ganawa music. Listeners attempt to find a position as close to the musician and music as possible. This does not seem out of the ordinary for concerts in general. But during Alila, however, the, the desired proximity to the music source centers around the Gemini. As the music begins to move the seated participants, they stand and enter the dance area, gravitating towards the Gemini. Ritual assistants may help them in a, to a place directly in front of the instrument, depending on their status at the Lila. In the extra below, Moroccan anthropologist Zineb Najduli emphasizes the Gemini's vital role. The Malam receding to the background, fulfilling his mediating role as a technician, giving voice to the spirits. Quote, the most coveted space is located exactly in front of the Gimri. The instrument is the master of the game, the one who attracts the Muluk to the dance area and guides the trance. The Kataka maintain a steady, strident sound, but it is the low-pitched melody of the Gimri that actually signifies the musical model of the blacks and invariably attracts the dancers. End quote. In the excerpt above, Najduli refers to the Gemri as the master of the game, echoing the Vienna Pact 30 years earlier that of all the Ganao instruments, the Gemri is at the heart of the Ganao religious order itself. The ritual routine action of hereditary practitioners also demonstrates Gemri's value to Ganao society. During the Lila, it is brought offerings before all other instruments. It is first to be purified, purified with incense, given milk, presented with dates, and sprinkled with orange blossom water. Malams, in particular, have a close relationship to their Gemri. And until recently, many of them made their own Gemri, like this one made by Malam Abdullah. Some adorn their Gemri with jewelry, adding a string of beads of, or cowrie shells to the upper part of the neck, as we saw with Malam Oktan's Gemri. See, Mohammed says, Malams nourish the Gemri every Thursday with an offering of jawi, incense. French Ganawa scholar Pierre Cles explains that the Ganawa consider the Hajjuj or Gembri like a living spirit who they must purify with incense. Held directly above the brazier, the incense wafts directly into the Gembri's mouth. Afterwards, they, quote, give a little baraka, positive energy, by playing tunes from the Lila repertoire, which serves as a musical offering that signifies gratitude and appreciation. A taboo symbol associated with the black diaspora just over 50 years ago without a historical archive. The Gembri and its music has risen to a new height of popularity and status in contemporary Morocco, becoming a symbol of cultural diversity, tolerance, and solidarity for the nation and beyond. When Mala Mahmoud passed in 2015, King Mohammed VI sent a public message expressing, quote, deep grief and great sorrow 
and praising Inya as a virtuoso mago and a great pioneer, an act that would have been unimaginable in his youth. The hereditary Ganao practitioners, the tempor for hereditary Ganao practitioners, the temporalities traced by, enabled, manipulated, and created by the Gili represent the enduring resilience of their culture. In closing, I will share a story Makama Zeta told me in my most recent visit before the pandemic in 2019, which, align, which uh, aligns to the notion of the living spirit of the Gembri and the duty of the Magam. She recalls an incident during her childhood. It was after the Muslim, an annual celebration. My father, Malam Mulkar, purified the Gembri and did all the necessary things, then put it away in his usual place, as he always does. But that night he didn't play it. I don't know why he did it, because he always did following the Muslim. A little later that evening, while I was doing my homework, I heard a sound, like the Gembri. It was the Gembri. I looked through the crack in my door and saw my father sitting there in the living room with my mother, with no Gembri. I was in the other room. I heard the sound again. It was coming from inside an enclosed space, like a closet, where my father kept his things, where he put the Gembri. I heard it again, just a few notes. I didn't know what was happening. This never happened before. Then I saw my father get up and, and go to the closet. He took the gambi and played it for a little while. After, he put it away again. It was quiet the rest of the night. So we do have time for some questions uh, from the audience. What's the purpose of the lila in the culture? What is the purpose of that ceremony, the ritual? Um, well, the ultimate goal is to maintain or restore balance in their world. And so their world means the, their collective community. Um, and so that, can, that collective community for them also correlates to people who are not within their circle, right? So the world itself. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's the ultimate goal. And so they do that through connection and communicating with um, their spirits, um, which they all believe is under the dominion of Allah. So they also consider themselves devout Muslims. Yeah. David and Benjamin. Thanks for your presentation, Lizzie. Um, you talked about the um, instrumentalists in the context of the Lila, thinking about their role as kind of calling out. Um, and, at this, and then I'm imagining uh, at a music festival, um, kind of what I see as a performance um, for an audience. Do they think about their role differently in that particular context than they might have in, in the yeah, there's a lot of things that I didn't talk about, and, and um, yeah, so that's in a different chapter that, that I do talk about that. Um, but in, in essence, yes, it's conceived of as different, um, but but also but also the same, right? So it's a complicated idea of what same and different are, um, and then it's also we also have to think about the different types of performances they do in the public. So some of these performances are on stage, as I showed you, the one on, on the video clip. Um, on stage, you know, uh, big stages with lots of audience, thousands of people, right, crowded, uh, out at a, like a festival scene that you can imagine. Um, and so in those spaces, they are very careful in choosing the pieces. So the repertoire comprises over 100 songs. And so not all of them will be the ones that are designated for this, you know, ceremony of, of the lila. I mean, they are part of the lila, but there are four different sections to the lila. And so it's only in that last final section where those, that part of the repertoire is performed. So there's a lot of things before that that are part of the lila itself because it's required for the preparation phase of it, but they're more, um, they don't call upon the, the spirits in the same way. And so for the, the hereditary practitioners I work with, Madam Mahmoud, Madam Abdullah, um, they would only play from that part of the repertoire. So you might have noticed that there was dancing. You would have noticed there was dancing in, in, in the video I showed you at the beginning of the festival. And so when the musicians themselves are dancing, that is part of that repertoire that comes in the first, first two parts of the lila uh, of 
So the lila proper itself, the musicians no longer dance. Right? They have a very different role to play. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, and so then there's another kind of uh, performance that's also public, which uh, this, the festival has called, um, you know, in the lilas, but they're not really lilas, but the practitioners have, were asked to perform lilas. And so they have found ways to kind of um, get around doing what they're asked to, to do, but also kind of playing with, um, you know, connecting with, with, with the others, right, to, to you know, play ball, so to speak. Um, and so they do perform some of those pieces, but not the way they normally would perform. Um, and so there's also ritual associated with when they're about to do a lila, right? So the whole context of, of, of um, a public performance is conceived differently. Even though the, the pieces might be the same or draw from the same repertoire. Um, but this is some of the issues that are also coming up that I, I mentioned in, in the second vignette, is, is that some people who are because some of these lilas are becoming more public or people are gaining access to, they are listening to these, the repertoire that belongs to the lila proper and then playing them on stage. And so that is causing, that has caused and continues to, to um, cause tension. All right. So part of what I'm trying to say here too is that the culture bearers um, understand what that law is, right? So they, they know how to protect that um, by performing according to, you know, their knowledge, but if you're not familiar with that knowledge, you just hear it as a piece of music, then uh, that can be dangerous, because for them, any time you perform, any time you play that music, it doesn't matter if you're in the context or not, right? They're always listening, right? They don't, they don't just come out when you call them, because they're, they, they're around, and so there is also that belief that they, they hold. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Maisie. Uh, a question, what is the role of now music within the whole culture of Morocco? Is it a minor form? Is it a really major? Is it growing and beginning to influence other forms of music in Morocco? The reason I ask is because when we were there not so many years ago, when we heard music, we weren't in the region that you were identifying primarily. Uh, it was not without music that was played. So I don't know how dominant it is within the culture or if it's the, anyway. Um, well, nowadays, like I mentioned, it's it's you could hear it. Pretty much anywhere, or I, I shouldn't say pretty much anywhere. <laughs> right, it's too. You could you could hear it um, in the medinas, specifically. I would say because at certain times that I go throughout the year, I could hear it in the medinas playing from music stores, for example. Specifically, um, because my interest is in the performances, the the festival performance, and also the lila. I tend to go during those periods of time, and so at that period of time, you hear it everywhere, pretty much, um, because there's there's a it's a big um, um, excitement in the city and surrounding cities and uh, people from different different areas will take buses and trains, you know, 10 hours away, 13 hours away just to come and see this festival and be part of it. Um, so in the past, you really didn't hear much of this music at all. It was done behind closed doors, right? Um, so recently now, like I said, it's really grown in popularity. You can hear them if you are particularly tourists, right? It's not unusual that you'll hear some Ganao music at the, at the uh, you know, as part of a, a restaurant gig you know, in the lobby, someone playing, um, that kind of thing. And, and they may or may not be malum. Um, so that's another thing that I didn't get to touch upon is the notion of who a malum is. So a gemri player is someone who plays the gemri. But to, you know, in order to be um, called a malum, you know, for the culture bearers, you have to, have to go through, you know, stages of, of, of apprenticeship, so to speak, um, in the context of that lila. So many people are donning that title as malum, you know, bringing their gemdis around saying, hey, I can play this music. And so it's become quite commodified in that sense. Um, so um, within the Moroccan, um, I guess the, the tourist context, you can see, hear it a lot. Uh, and many people do play it. It's also a kind of music that has been popular among, another thing I didn't get a chance to talk about, um, alternative uh, groups, uh, music groups, there's rock fusion groups in the 1970s that were really countercultural, and so one of their, their band members was uh, fronted by a, a Ganawa who was from Esawira, and he played Gembri, right? And so even just that symbol of playing the, the Gembri in the 1970s when it was really not, um, not uh, tolerated, that when it was still something that people only heard in these private ceremonies and you had to be invited to, um, that was a big deal. But nowadays you really hear, you hear young fusion groups, um, you know, 2000s, 
early 2000, I was there, a lot of different groups, you know, either taking the instrument, taking some parts of the melodies, playing the karaoke, you know, on stage. And so there's a lot of that fusion happening. And the Malam themselves, like Malam Mahmoud, he, like I mentioned that they were proponents and really um, bringing this onto the world stage because he, he would play music with Farrah Sanders, with um, other, other types of world music artists on big stages around the world. And so they are, they do the festival circuit and that's kind of how I first met them too, was in Japan when they were on that festival circuit and they're invited. And they've been at the Montreal Jazz Festival, right, um, in, in 1980s or so. So they really started, um, people had heard about them and largely through some of these connections with uh, American musicians. Um, jazz pianist Randy Weston was being one, Jimi Hendrix too had, had gone to Esuera and you know made some mention of it and that kind of caught people's attention. Um, and so their sounds were traveling back and forth from I'd say the, the you know, at least the seventies and probably earlier because like I mentioned, Paul Bowles was also in, in Morocco. And so they, these, these people, um, again, people who are outside of the Moroccan tradition, the outsiders, um, opened music clubs and so forth and they would invite certain types of artists to come and perform. And so those were their initial spaces. So it really didn't have much of a foothold in the early days. Right, it was something that was shunned, like I, I had mentioned before, um, and looked down upon. Uh, frankly, and so nowadays people have, like I mentioned, you know, the king, you know, giving a public speech when when the malum dies uh, is something incredible, right? That doesn't happen every day, and so that was unimaginable. So, so just to think about the importance it has now in, in the culture um, is very different. I mean, I don't know if I answered your question, Jim. I've touched on different things, but in essence, um, there is there's collaboration around. It doesn't mix with the Andalusian tradition. Like that Andalusian tr tradition is a classical music tradition, the Arab Andalusian tr uh, tradition in Morocco. That kind of has its own space. Um, but this one is really what I, I um, is more of a popular music culture now. So among the youth and even some of the elite, right, they will, they will, now I'm not sure, you know, in the late 2000s, but when, in the early 2000s when I was there, a lot of um, the malam that I, I was working with would get invitations uh, for for them to come and play at you know these high society events, and so so yeah. So uh, yeah, thank you, Mitzi. Very interesting. Um, I'm interested. Uh, you made a few comments about uh, the relationship with Islam and and the self identity of, of these uh, practitioners as developed Muslims. On the other hand, accusations that some of these practices are not Islamic, and I'm just curious how they navigate. Is that a concern? Uh, do they defend the, the Islamic integrity of these practices? Do they ignore the criticisms? Is that is that part of the conversation? Um, there's there's no. Um, there are conversations from the past, like I mentioned, but these days there's no sense that. And working with the practitioners that I do, there's no sense that they there is ever a question. Right. So, so there's no need that they feel they need to defend anything, right? It's something they do within their blood. And a lot of these, we have to think also African cultures were Islamized before they, they went to Morocco anyway. So it's not unlikely that these, these practices are derived if they were from, when you looked at the trajectory, we're not sure where, where it originated necessarily, but, um, but they might have already been Islam, Islamized. And so some of the, the um, I guess concerns or, or, or the views of the, the Ganawa or the, the African diaspora communities who were brought from these different, you know, from West Africa or different communities was that because they blended and mixed Islam with their own cultural practices that it was a lower form of Islam. And so that, you know, there's not much spoken about it because of denial, right? There's a lot of denial about um, racism and about you know enslavement and so forth in, in Morocco, which is a re reason why there's not much um, in the historical, there's no historical archive about the Ganawa or the instruments. Um, but the, the practitioners themselves don't, don't feel the need to defend. The only thing was I mentioned that their association to Bilal, right? So Bilal is the patron saint, the patron saint for their, um, for, for the for the Ganawa and because it's not a Sufi tradition per se, but people have made connections to it being a Sufi tradition. So all Sufi traditions usually have a particular founder that they're descended right from. And so their practice, and I, I don't know when this started, uh, uh, but always have, have a page uh, or venerate Bilal. So they venerate in all their songs, they're venerating Allah, 
Muhammad and Bilal. So those are the three that you always hear in every single song. And so their their connection to Islam is is integrated, is you know, embodied in all their music. Yeah. Hope that answered your question. Yeah. You see, I'm interested in um, the playing. I heard a lot of percussive, uh, percussive. I mean, and it's like a combination of drum and a, and a bass instrument almost. And and they said sometimes you mentioned that sometimes the drums are accompanied, but sometimes there aren't drums. Uh, when you're hearing it, are they they do a combination of? Uh, the plucking and drumming simultaneously? Yes, yeah, so there, there are no drums that are part of the lila proper. So when you hear the, there's the, um, the castanets with the drums and they play separately at a different part of the ceremony. I have a video, can I show you a quick little video? Well, I, I heard the metal, yeah. But you can see here, um, for example, this is during procession. This is a lila, this is the beginning part. They're going out in the old city now, possessing the women are doing ululations. So these are the offerings I mentioned, right? So that's the orange blossom rose water. So you have the drum there that's played. So that's Malam. Sorry for speaking over the music. That's Malam Makodiana. So he's one of the um, he is a, that's a lead instrument, and so he's the leader of the music uh, of, of the um, of the ensemble, so he's playing the drums, so he won't be playing the gembe at this time. So this is only during this section. So that's what I was uh, commenting on on farmers' uh, kind of uh, description of what he heard. That it's unlikely that the drums would have been playing at the same time as the gembe because I've never seen that happen. But you know that was a hundred years ago, so it could be that it was a different. Uh, they they performed it differently, um, but it could also be that he 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 misheard or thought there was a drum, but it was because the, the malam will, will hit while he's playing. If you if you listen to flamenco guitar too, you can hear how a, a musician will, they'll, they'll strum, the, the way they strum, they kind of hit, right? The plucking is not really a plucking, they pluck, but they hit the strings. I don't, I don't play, so, but they kind of hit it like this. And their hand is always touching. Yeah. And so they're creating those rhythms as they're, the, the, sorry, the percussive rhythms as they're playing. So there's, there's like three different, four different timbres that's created just by this instrument. So it's possible that he heard it, you know, I'm talking about farmer, he, or, or he heard that and he didn't really quite see what was there because you can see there's a, there could be a lot of activity that's happening. People are dancing and, and the gembri or the, the malam is usually, like you see, he's seated in the back, right? Everyone's standing. And so you wouldn't see him unless you're really close to them, right? Um, so it could have been that he was accompanying himself, but it could also be, he used the term, um, tabal is the term for drum, but he used dardaba, and dardaba is also a term that sometimes people used to refer to that lila proper, um, and it has to do with stomping feet. So it could be that because of the way uh, people are moving, that that loud stomping of feet, and I, I don't know, I'm just speculating, you know, we don't, we don't know <laughs> that situation a hundred years ago, but it's unlikely, I think, that there was... There were drums there. Did I answer your question, Daniel? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's usually a percussive instrument. It's, I guess all string instruments are. Or, or can be percussive. Yeah. Though. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's a combination. Yeah. So it's because they're always hitting it with the, this yeah. part of their hand, and and they're also, the way they hit the string is yeah. it's quite percussive as opposed to I mean they, it's a plucked lute. Uh, as opposed to a bold loop, but, but they're, they're really kind of hitting the strings more than anything, and it's storming sometimes too. Okay, maybe you have a uh, last question. Oh, last question, no question. All right, okay. I have many questions, but uh, thank you so much for this really fascinating uh, dive into a particular culture and the ways in which music is at the center of everything that they think is important. Um, uh, I was particularly interested in the, the um, kind of tracing the origins of the instrument, um, and of course it reminds uh, me of another um, probably West African instrument that came to North America, the banjo. Are there ways in which um, the gembri was used in order to kind of create caricatures of the Nava people in the 
same way that the banjo was in periods of slavery and after slavery? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, there are, uh, so this is uh, Cynthia Becker I mentioned in, uh, that she just, uh, in 2020, was quoting Host as well, right? Because she, she does uh, work in Morocco as well and, and had uh, published a book of Okinawa music. And she is an art historian, looks at visual culture. And so she has seen some pictures and images of that kind of, of what you're talking about, where, um, you know, the gembri and the, um, the castanet players are kind of, uh, looked upon in that, in that, that light of, of you know, uh, exotic, exoticized kind of, is, is, that, is that what you mean? Yeah, or, or even played in ways that were meant to um, create kind of dehumanizing caricatures of. I don't, I didn't come across that kind of um, reading of it, um, but more of that, um, you know, exoticizing the othering of, of this other, of this community. I should say. Um, and you do see that. I mean, interestingly, where I work in Esuira, and so um, some of you have been to Morocco. How many of you have been to Morocco? Okay. Yeah, so you would know that in the Medinas, there's these open squares, right? And so, and there are buskers um, that, that might be there. And so if you, how many of you have seen buskers of Ganawa music? Okay, playing the gembri or the castanets? Both, okay. Uh, where was that? Can I ask you? Okay. Yeah. Um, I asked because I don't. I have. Um, I know in Esawira they don't. They don't busk with their instruments. You don't. You don't see Ganawa in the public squares busking. They don't even bring the instruments around. So it's quite a very, um, like I mentioned, very private, closed tradition, and they protect it quite well there. Uh, it seems to me. Um, and then in places like Marrakesh and Fez, though, you will see the more like itinerants, right? And so you see them in the squares, you know, playing playing the castanets and with their with their um, Harry, um, you know, caps, asking for money, collecting money, or sometimes putting something down in the square and expecting a donation. Um, but that does not is not um, what the hereditary practitioners that I worked with do. And in fact, it was it, yeah, I should you know I have to take it back what I just said because in 2019 when I was there. I was having uh, lunch in the Medina with uh, Sayyid Muhammad, and, and someone came around actually with a, I think he was uh, playing cat cubs. I had never seen that in Esuira, right? This is like, I've been there t <laughs> over the last 20 years, and I just kind of said, I said, I, he looked, and I looked, and I think we both looked at each other, knowing that there was something kind of out of place, and he says, oh, he's not from here, that's what he said. Um, but I did see them in Fez, and I saw them in Marrakesh as itinerants. And so this is the, those pictures I'm talking about, the posters and the postcards, you know, this um, exoticizing of, of, you know, of the other, uh, and looking at their, you know, even the way if you, you think about how farmer writes about their, their um, festivals, right? There is a certain tone to them, a, a derogatory tone to them. And so these were looked in that way, and particularly by people who are coming, you know, from Europe and visiting too, right? Something, something new, something different, a bit of a spectacle too. Um, so, yes. So not maybe not exactly what what we were thinking, but. Well, it's clear that we have more questions, uh, but this time let's give these here our applause. <laughs> with me and with each other. Thank you again for having us.